Real blue collar stuff, and that brings us to track three away from here. Yeah, away from here is really a raw nerve um, for a lot of people that have heard it. I, I was home Christmas time and got questioned quite a bit about uh, away from here and Lonesome But Free and was asked by a lot of my relations about who they were about. They wanted to know. And I wouldn't tell them because I said, if, if you guys can't work it out, then obviously you haven't listened to the song hard enough. But there were these beautiful little mill homes just outside of Grafton where one of my uncles lived. And um, I used to hear stories about this little area. It was just they were purpose built for the mill workers. Um, it was a cycle that was very hard to break. There was, uh, you know, people would have a good old drink on Friday night and you'd hear people fighting every now and then. It was mainly struggles over lack of money. And it was one of those, uh, those cycles that was very hard to break. And away from here is a story that just had to be told. It's very much a blue collar story, but we've had so many people that come up after shows saying how much they love that tune. And I'm, I'm chuffed because it's one of my favorites on the record. You touched on time as a friend of mine before. Tell us the genesis of that story. Well, it's really about me being a sly dog. At, at age 18, I had this, this beautiful girl who used to come to these gigs at the Crown Hotel and, and she had this big boyfriend, which never really perturbed me. I was pretty brave when I was a kid. Do you remember her name? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I wanted to remain innocent. But every now and then, she'd wait till the boyfriend wasn't looking and give me this big you know, wink across the room and I'd be thinking, wow, you know, and I'd wait till he wasn't looking and return the favour. And, <laughs> and I told Paul Kelly about it and he said to me, mate, it's a great era of your life. It's the sly dog era. And he said, you've just got to bide your time in these situations. And the song is just about biding your time. And um, it's so true. We won in the end, but you had to just think about the, the biding your time thing. So when you say we won in the end, you mean you did get together with her? Yes, I did. There was two lines at the end that says... I wasn't um, sure about that in the, the lyrics here. <laughs> There's two lines that Paul wanted to contribute on. I said, we're going to be entwined at the end. And that obviously meant you were going to get the girl. But he said, um, uh, I'm going to see you shine. And I said, what do you mean by I'm going to see you shine? He said, mate, it's the sweat on her brow. <laughs> I said, you dirty Isn't dog. It, she glows, doesn't she? She glows, yeah. you know. And, and it's just like, he's, he's such a poet. Great, a great poet to write with. And um, he, he had a great contribution to that tune. We wrote it actually doing a film clip for an old song. We are bored and we kept sliding a pad across the table to each other, doing verse by verse. And Time as a Friend of Mine was one of the first songs we wrote at this film clip. Sounds like dueling, dueling lyrics. It was very much like that, actually. Very much like you that. You know, just sliding out the uh, liner notes here from the, the CD, this was something that I got to do last night in preparation for our chat today. And we don't get to do this very much nowadays. As we get older, we get too busy. And it was just such a pleasure to read through the liner notes and just find out all the people involved in making the album. There's so many people behind the scenes of making a record. I, when I first received this, I, I arrived in Perth, I think. Uh, it might have been Melbourne, sorry. And I was promoting the record. And I actually had this, this package in my hand, you know. And I'm looking at it thinking, so this is it. This is the end of our six months of recording and writing, or longer time Eight writing. months writing, yeah. Photo shoots, you know, all the stuff. And as much as a lot of people say to me now, get on the website, you know, download the tracks and you can buy them for a buck sixty or whatever per track. I still get a big kick out of receiving a record, anything that I buy. I, I bought a bunch of records in Newtown yesterday from a little mu music shop because I just love buying music. But I love to have this in my hand. I've got to have this because I like to see who played guitar. I like to read um, the rhyme schemes people use. I just think it's really inspiring to see how people put their lyrics together. I'm still learning about it, and, um, and even people like Don Walker admit to still learning on the craft of writing songs, which I, I don't know how, because to me they're, they're very much our yardsticks as songwriters. But I do like to have this in my hand when I'm listening to an album, and, and just to follow the, the flow of it as well. Back to the album, Fisherman, this must really resonate with the dioxin scare going on in Sydney Harbour at the moment. Well, it resonates with a lot of people. Um, I'm a, a fisherman that is a recreational fisherman with my kids. I go out and, and fish and I like to come home with some fish, you know, when I do go out. But then there was the other side of the story with buying back licences, you know. And the money that was raised from buying your fishing licence was going to be able to buy these licences, commercial licences back. Well, an old guy sat me down on a boat once and gave me the other side of the story. And fisherman is the exact other side of the story from, you know, the recreational side. It's the, the person that's been a third or fourth generation fisherman and their license has been bought, where does it leave them, you know? This old guy, I pictured him sitting on this old deck overlooking this bay where I started to write the song. And, um, and you know, the chorus, just the way it sort of goes. I throw out my soul to the wild blue yonder And where it take me, sometimes I wonder I can find my way home by the stars in the sky Cause I'm a fisherman, 
yes, a fisherman till the day I die. And that line I wrote that afternoon on the boat with him was pretty well the guts of the tune. And he said to me, he said, um, what do you mean a fisherman till I die? I said, well, look, even though your license has been bought, what else are you going to be? Yeah. You know? So that was where the tune came from. It was a good fisherman line. Yeah. You know, some people have said, country music sure is easy to sing. I've got to say, listening to this last night, it's very difficult, a lot of the lyrics and uh, the, the tune, the way you get them to meld. I tried singing along, and it's, it's uh, take a lot of practice. Well, you know, I, I don't actually think about the singing side of it as much these days because I feel that if it's feeling natural, uh, my producer, Nash Chambers, this is our third effort together, and he makes me feel very comfortable. He, he actually insists that I try and keep some of the, the vocals that we do in the band tracks because it's, it's like getting to know a friend from the first meeting with, with a song that you've written. Um, you're warm to them with each moment you spend with them. And, um, but sometimes the spark that you get when you first meet someone, uh, you can't capture again. So we, we actually try and keep a few of the, the first vocals that we do with the band, if possible, without getting too much spill from guitars. And the, just the, the, the unknown entity that, you know, you don't know this song, but it, it feels good, that, that spirit is very hard to catch. So we try and capture that quite a bit. But I, I honestly don't think about the singing as much. I just think about, um, what the listener is copying. I just think about them in, in, in the first instance. We've just, of course, seen a getaway car, so we'll move on to my town. Tell us about that one. Yeah, well, look, um, from the perspective of a young kid riding a push bike around a town, this is pretty well where it was. If I had had a video camera to take around Grafton when I was a kid sitting on my bike and see the things that we used to see, um, I saw the demise of the railway station slowly getting smaller and smaller. We always ran, ran through South Grafton to be able to, uh, to get over to where we had to go through the railway yards. Um, I'd see you know, a bloke selling beans from his garden at the back. He'd have a little sign, beans for sale. You know. I saw a, a, you know, a, a sawmill with uh, you know, casual work wanted. C casual workers needed at this mill, please phone this number. Um, they're just little observations that I think are so important. Don Walker grew up in the same town as me. He knew exactly what I was talking about. He wrote the last verse about my mum, who's an artist, and he said, um, I've got this last verse, he said, you can love it or hate it, you know? He, he just slung it across the table, and it was, it was a very personal thing for Don to write something about my mum. And to be able to say that she's the reason I keep going back to this town is, is pretty special. And he got it in one. It's very special for you to let him do that, too. Well, yeah, he was, he was pretty honoured that I actually didn't censor it even. I was just really happy with the way it actually formed. And I gave him the chorus as it was. I gave him uh, the first two verses as my observations as a kid, and he got it straight away. Um, like I said, he's, he's, he's always sort of, you know, putting, putting these, these positive things on me, saying how I deliver all these fait accompli songs, but it's not the case. He adds some incredible stuff. Troy, it wouldn't be an Australian country music album without a bush ranger in there somewhere. <laughs> Wanted man. <laughs> Well, look, um, I've been a fan of uh, Captain Thunderbolt for a long time, and I thought, I had this instrumental that I'd written, but I really wanted to do, like the Eagles did on Desperado's album, they did a, a reprise at the end. I've always been a fan of that, that whole idea. So to put the song in the middle uh, was obviously something that I wanted to do, but I wanted to, to link it with something at the end, which sums up the record, which was the instrumental. But we sat and we talked about how charming this bloke was. He wasn't like an Ed Kelly, who was just running from the police because he'd killed people. He never, never fired a shot in anger generally, he only had it for protection, but he was an incredible horseman. So he was a, an obvious romantic choice for this song. And um, you know, he, he was so good with his horses and he only stole thoroughbreds so no one could catch him. And we thought that was pretty cool. You just mentioned the Eagles, who are some of your other influences? Look, um, apart from all the country ones I've had, is with John Fogarty, he was just such an inspiration. I always loved his guitar playing as an artist. Um, singers play guitar a different way to actual guitar, dedicated guitar players do. And they phrase like a singer. And he was the triple threat artist to me. He was like the singer, you know, the songwriter and the musician. They were all in one and it was a complete package. And I think a lot of the, the kids growing up around Grafton who ins were inspired by Credence in particular and the Eagles, uh, wanted to be those sorts of artists. You weren't allowed in a band if you couldn't actually play and sing. You know, you had to pull your weight. So it was, it was a part of, it was a good hard lesson, I suppose, to not just be get up the front and be some glamorous singer. You actually had to be a musician as well. Is it a bit like that, a triple threat? Do you see them as an inspiration, but also like, a, I just want to be better than them? Or? 
Well, look, I think you can use them as yardsticks, that's for sure. I mean, I don't think it'd ever be better, but I, I really do believe that to have those people as inspirations are really important. I mean, to watch, when I was a kid, I first got this little Strat copy guitar and, and listened to Stevie Ray Vaughan, and I'd, I'd, I'd sit on the veranda with a little tiny amp that, you know, was so quiet you could hardly hear it. But you were just practicing these little licks that you were hearing on a record, and this is all part of your growing up. And um, you, you, you pull these things out and you chuck them into your career every now and then, and it, it surprises people just how deep your influences go. What about one of your contemporaries, Keith Urban, he's trailblazing his way across the United States. Do you have any uh, aspirations to emulate his success there? Well, look, I think people don't realise that Keith's apprenticeship's been 10 years and he's had to actually forego everything he's done in Australia to just focus on America. And, and I've been happier here with, with my setup because I suppose I really love this country, I like our lifestyle, and it, it probably is a comfort zone in some ways, but I do get there once a year. I love going over there to write, and I do enjoy watching what Keith's done and watching the progression of, of how his career has taken hold, because I've seen the struggles. I've been over there and talked to him when he couldn't even afford to keep up payments on a car, you know? So you see the good and the bad and the indifferent when it comes to a career like that, but all power to him. I don't think I'd ever be able to put up with 10 years of struggle for, for that amount of time, no, no amount of result would, would be worth it for me. It must be tough touring a lot when you're a family man. Do they ever come along for the ride? Oh, we, we drag them out when we can. We mix it up and I think the last little trip we did in a Winnebago together was fantastic. It was an exciting thing. There was a lot of drama. There was a cyclone going on on the coast with Larry whipping the coast and, and the kids just loved it. We're getting the wind up here because uh, you've got a very busy day in front of you. I've got to whip through a couple more tracks no on the worries. album here. Uh, how about Long As I Don't See You? That's a bit of a laugh, isn't it? Well, it is a laugh. Um, it was one of those tunes that um, I'd started off with just a lyric sitting on the computer for about a year. And I finally told my Paul Kelly about the idea that I had and we started you know, conversing, we got together, finished it off. It's about this poor bloke who just couldn't stand seeing this girl. He just fell apart every time we saw her. And I, I've been in that situation a lot. <laughs> Haven't we all? Family fun. Family Farm, it's about Slim Dusty going back and buying his property back at Nulla Nulla. I read it on the front of a Post magazine and thought, now that is just such a, a full circle trip. To be able to come back and buy somewhere back that was yours in the first place, that was a very special song to be able to write. And you got to play it to him? Yeah, we got, got to play for him and, and enjoy as well. In its early stages, and I was so chuffed, so chuffed. Walking away. Walking Away uh, was a, a bit of a follow-on from a story I'd read in the front of a newspaper. Um, there was a, a family getting ready to leave a property, a fourth generation property. He had everything he owned, what was left out of the house in his arms, and he had his family sitting off in the back out of, out of focus in, the, in their car waiting. I thought Walking Away was just one of those ways to pay homage to adversity that people face in the land. And the last song on the album, Rivertown. Oh, well, look, Rivertown was one, written about McLean, which is just down the road. Um, it was one of those incredible harvest festivals that they have down there, where they shut the street off and it's just continually, it's like, it's like going to New Orleans in a, in a way, but it's just a smaller version. And you know, there was floods that came through in 74, everything that was mentioned in there was very local. And um, I had a great time growing up there playing in bands, incredible people and, and still lifelong friends that still live there. I love the last track on the album, the instrumental Yellow Belly. And a, what's a national guitar? Well, the National is exactly the same shape as this, but it's made out of a, like a, a steel body. Uh, it's got a resonator in it, which sounds just incredible. It's sounds like on the front of Dire Straits. Yeah, yeah. Or, um, Brothers you know, you, you hear Paul Simon talking about the Mississippi River just shining like a National guitar. They're the most amazing looking guitar you'll ever see. You wanted to work that in an instrumental? Yeah, well look, I'd written it out on the road and I had this little form that I was working on. The first week that I received it, my manager and I were on the road and... And it was like a, um, just a real trip to be able to put a capo on and hear this thing, it was so inspiring and it got this little melody going on. Like... And that came from uh, pretty well just receiving the guitar and I reckon songs arrive in guitars for sure and I keep telling my wife that so I can get a few more guitars. <laughs> How many have you got? Too many. <laughs> Can you ever have too many? No, no. There's, there's, um, there's, there's definitely places in the collection for all of them, and uh, and they're all very special. I record with a lot, I tour with a lot, and um, there's a couple that I sit in the house just to just to perv on. <laughs> you're 36 now. Do you see yourself still touring like Mick and the Boys when you're in your 60s? Oh, geez, I, I don't know how they keep it up at that level, the world tour thing. I suppose it'd be pretty cushy having your own chef and stuff on the road with you, but I'd like to still be around making music. I mean. You know, if I wasn't, even if I wasn't doing it full time, I'd still be wanting to get out and play every couple of weekends just to keep my hand in, because I just get such a buzz out of it, and just plugging in the guitar and playing. 
Troy, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and talking to us today. But before I let you go, yep. would you play us something? Sure. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, I've been driving every back road, me in this old car. One headlight working, and it's only overheated three times so far. And I guess that's pretty good. When I lost sight of the city, I felt a big relief. It took me to a place, a place where I'd always want to be. I'm going back home. I'm going back home to where people call you by your first name. I'm going back home to where people treat you just the same as they always have. Well, yes, there was a woman, I guess you know the end Cause now I'm looking for a place for a broken heart to mend That's why I'm going back home I'm going back home to where people call you by your first name I'm going back home to where people treat you just the same as they always have back home Yeah, I'm going back home Well, we got the news this morning Dad had passed away A new day was dawning And the tears were rolling down my face as I was going back home I'm going back home to where people call you by your first name I'm going back home to where people treat you just the same as they always have I've been driving every back road again and again With one headlight working and it only overheats every now and then And I guess that's pretty good